everyone. Today I'm here to talk about all the things I read in April. April was a really great reading month for me, at least in terms of numbers. I finished 11 books, but when I looked at my page count on my reading spreadsheet, I realized that I, I really read about the same number of pages as, as I've been reading throughout the whole year. It just felt like I was getting through a lot because I had gravitated towards shorter books, but oh well. I'm going to talk about audiobooks first, just because otherwise I will forget to mention them. So earlier in the month, I listened to Eight Perfect Murders. It's a story of a man who works in a mystery bookshop. One day he's approached by an FBI agent who is curious about a list that he wrote for the bookstore's blog a few years previous, uh, titled Eight Perfect Murders, wherein the protagonist detailed eight perfect murders that happened in fiction. There's someone out there who has been committing murders that match the books that he described. While they seemed initially disconnected because they were all different victims, different, you know, ways of killing them, different times of day, different locations, the FBI agent has this theory that they are all connected because they were all mentioned on this list. So we're following the mystery from there. It definitely isn't as predictable as I'd expected. There are definitely twists and turns that whether or not they worked for me, I, I think is besides the point. I think that it's still impressive that he managed to pull the wool over my eyes effectively a lot of different times. I don't think that it was the most satisfying book. You know, it definitely went out of left field in, in terms of some of the twists and turns, but overall it was really enjoyable. It's one that I binged in about 24 hours, so I definitely really was compelled by it and wanted to know what happened, but it wasn't the most tightly constructed story that I've ever read. Um, and I think perhaps it's difficult for an author like this to compare himself to so many other popular and well-regarded writers, because I don't necessarily think that maybe he was as good as some of those other writers. I think I'd only read one of the books on the list, which was The Secret History, and I'm not the most spoiler-adverse person in the world, so this book does spoil the murders of all of these books. Why and how the murders took place, it's pretty, as you know, pivotal to understanding the book and how the murders in the book are being committed. If you are really spoiler averse, I would look at the list of books that are mentioned in this book in advance, just to make sure that nothing you really care about is going to be spoiled. I think the one that would pertain the most to booktube is The Secret History. It does spoil what happens in The Secret History and more importantly, why it happens, which is kind of a big thing with that book. So if you would be upset to have that book spoiled for you, then I wouldn't recommend this. But if you're like me and you're not spoiler averse, then I would say it's a really enjoyable book. At first it gave me hints of the feeling that I got when I read Magpie Murders, which is one of my favorite mystery novels of all time. It's definitely not as good as that though. And the other book that I read on audio this month, I really didn't enjoy that much. And that was The Flat Share by Beth O'Leary. This is a book that I've heard talked about a lot on booktube. It is the story of two young people living in London. One of them has a flat. He posts an ad saying he needs someone to stay in the flat. He wants a roommate, but they're going to be sharing a bed. He works nights, so he will need the apartment during the day. And he finds a roommate who works the typical nine to five and needs the flat at night. So they flip flop when they're in the flat. And they start exchanging notes and then they fall in love because it's a romance novel. So for me, it just wasn't as cute as I thought it would be. I think most of the tension in this book comes from two key moments. When are they gonna meet for the first time and when are they gonna bang? And I think that a lot of the tension is just directed toward those two things rather than me being really invested and interested in them and their relationship. They were definitely fleshed out characters, like the the man is a hospice nurse and so you hear a lot about that. He also has a brother who's in prison, so you also hear a lot about their relationship and the case. And then the, the woman in the relationship, she works for a publisher, so you, you hear about the projects that she's working on. and. She has an abusive ex-boyfriend, and so you also hear a lot about her trying to come to terms with the fact that she was in an abusive relationship and how it impacts her relationship with other men moving forward. There was so much going on on the outside that I don't feel like there was actually enough emphasis put on their relationship, surprisingly. I just wasn't that invested in them before or after they got together, and it just really didn't work for me. I don't, I don't know what else it could be about, because I think it can be frustrating when it feels like there are just two central characters and the world outside of them doesn't exist and all of the, the their friends and all of the you know side characters just feel like cardboard cutouts that are, are interacting around the protagonists. I don't like when that happens either, but there just was something about this book that didn't work for me. And I think that's what it is. I think that just like, the relationship felt like pretty undervalued in comparison to everything else that was going on, like the publishing projects that she was working on, dealing with her boyfriend, the brother's trial, and 
Also, the, the man is trying to find a long lost lover for one of his patients who is dying. It just like, there's a lot happening for a relatively short book. And I, I just, the relationship was one of the least interesting parts of it for me. And I think it's, you know, in a romance novel, something that should be the driving force of everything else and what kind of brings everything together. Didn't really work for me. Next, I'm gonna go through my stack of books that I read. I'm just gonna talk about them in the order that they're in this pile. So it's not the order in which I read them and it's not my least favorite to favorite. It just, how I stacked them up. First being The Test by Sylvain Novell. I have read the first in his series, Sleeping Giants is the first one, and I liked it okay. At the time I read it, there weren't any other subsequent books in the series, and if they had existed, I probably would have read them. But since they didn't, I kind of lost steam, and now I don't remember enough about the books to really want to read those other ones without reading the other one first. I don't know. That's just to say that I do have experience with Sylvain Novell. And I knew that I enjoyed his writing. This is a tour novella about a man taking a British citizenship exam. And it kind of goes unexpected places, to say the least. I don't want to say anything else because I think that part of the fun is seeing where it goes and what is different about it. A lot of people have compared it to a Black Mirror episode. I think that's an apt comparison. There's a lot of this book that takes place exclusively in dialogue. So if that isn't your thing, this might frustrate you because there's not a lot of description. There's not even a lot of like narrative prose. It's really fueled by dialogue between characters. So if that isn't your kind of thing, it's like a very snappy writing that almost feels like reading a, a, a transcript or a play script than it is like reading a novel. I don't know. Kind of how I felt about it. Definitely had really fast pace and momentum because of it, but if that doesn't sound appealing to you, I don't know if this would. It is a little bit like, it's like light sci-fi. I enjoyed it for the most part, but it's probably not gonna be something that stays with me too much, and I don't feel the need to ever revisit it again. So I'm glad I read it, but I'm happy to move on from it as well. I also read The Way of the House Husband, volume one by Kosuke Ono, which is a manga series about a man who is a former Yakuza. This is just like a humorous manga. There's really not much story going on. It's just a, a, basically a bunch of action movie gags and gangster gags contrasted with like the domesticity of real life. So he is a house husband. He does things like cook and clean and do the shopping for his wife, but like you don't get any information on like how they met or why they're in a relationship or anything about their relationship. It mostly is, I think, serves to be funny seeing like this guy be extremely aggressive, for instance, to a knife salesman who's trying to scam him and, and the way he deals with that circumstance, he uses his Yakuza background to influence that interaction, for instance. The thing I appreciate about this is that it, it doesn't cast him being a house husband as a step down. It doesn't try to humiliate him for doing something as a more, more stereotypically feminized role. Those parts aren't played for laughs. The laughs come from the fact that you're seeing someone who was a gangster treat chores and housework as a gangster would. But I don't think that the jokes come at his expense because he's doing something traditionally feminine and therefore it's funny. But it's not really generally my thing because there is no story. It does, it might go somewhere, there might be a through line of like recurring characters and stuff, but I think that this is basically just a series of jokes, visual jokes of him doing housework and cooking in a very hyper-masculine way. So here's an example. He's giving a motivational speech to something saying that it has to prove something to himself. And then it's the Roomba that he's turning on. So next page, you watch him watch the Roomba go around the room. So, you know, it's funny. I probably not gonna hold on to this, but it was, it was an amusing, you know, hour of my life. All right, next we have Old Baggage by Lisa Evans. This is a novel about a couple of uh, former suffragettes living in the late 1920s in London. And now that the women have earned the vote, they, particularly the protagonist, Maddie, is having a hard time finding a place and finding a new thing to drive and motivate her. She's been giving a lot of speeches talking about the past and the his history of the suffragettes, but one day a former suffragette who is getting really into fascism approaches her and asks her, like, why are you just giving all of these uh, outdated speeches? There are new political issues to get behind and kind of encourages her to consider fascism. Maddie is disgusted and decides instead that she's gonna form a social club for young women to teach them not only the history of things like women's rights, but also practical skills like javelin throwing and adventuring. And she, she wants to like, f to shape these women, these young women to be more well-rounded and prepared for the world because she finds that a lot of them aren't necessarily ready or willing to vote. Like they, they might not know why they should vote. They might not know the struggle that came before them to earn them the vote. And they might not be informed politically enough to know for whom to vote. So she takes a collection of girls under her wing to try and teach them. It's an extremely heartwarming story. There's just a lot of warmth to this story. Like I was just, 
felt like I was being hugged by this book the whole time. Like the conflict was relatively minimal, although there is conflict. It's not happy the whole time. Def things definitely go awry. There certainly is conflict, but I think the characters are really well-rounded. They're really genuine and they're so endearing. And it's a book that made me tear up at the end because the end was just so sweet. And perhaps it might have come across as cloying in someone else's hands, but I think Lisa Evans handled it so deftly that it just felt so genuine and so just so warm. That's the only word that I can think of to describe my reading experience with this. I really enjoyed it. And I would definitely recommend it because it, it felt very escapist and it felt very positive. I think it's just exactly what I needed in this time, so I would definitely recommend this book. Another novella I read this month was All Systems Read by Martha Wells. This has been pretty popular on booktube, so I don't want to talk about it too much because I don't have a lot positive to say, unfortunately. This is the first in the Murderbot Diaries, so we're following a protagonist named Murderbot. That's what kind of what they've named themselves, and they are a an android that has been constructed to aid, aid humans in various missions. But Murderbot has hacked its own governance systems to have agency and is hiding that from the humans that they're helping. Which is an intriguing enough premise, I guess, but I just didn't care very much about what was happening. I thought the plot was so-so, and I, I know people love Murderbot, I just didn't find anything to be that endearing to me about their personality, so I just didn't gravitate toward this in the way that others have, and I wonder what was missing from my reading experience. I can't pinpoint it, but I thought this was fine. I read the whole thing. It was okay, but I don't feel any compulsion to continue on the series, so I'm sorry. I just, I, I had a couple of false starts with this one as well. I tried it on ebook, and I tried it on audiobook before I finally read the physical copy, and I think that like my initial instincts were right. I just think, don't think the writing worked for me. And I didn't find the characterization to be unique enough or interesting enough or well done enough for me to feel like I really liked this or was impressed by it because I thought it was fine. Another novella that I thought was just fine was Maglu by Otessa Moshveg. This was her first published work, but it was recently republished in this little package. It is a novella about a man named Maglu who wakes up drunk one day, covered in blood, to find that he has been accused of murdering his best friend. And he is essentially like on his way to trial. He's held in his the ship's brig and he is being taken to trial for the murder of his friend. But he is so drunk that he can't remember if he did it or not. He doesn't really know. Like he thinks his friend is alive at the beginning of this book. It's very dreamy in like a fever dream sense. Um, narrative of him remembering things that he did with his friend, how they met, how they became friends, contrasted with scenes in the present of him being haunted, but also him being very sick because he's clearly an alcoholic and is going through withdrawal. So it's not a pleasant read. It's very visceral and graphic in the way that Otessa Moshveg is. She tends to write books that have kind of vile characters doing pretty gross things, and, and Moshveg does not shy away from talking about bodily functions in extreme detail at times, which makes them feel very real and visceral. But her characters always have a humanity to them. They're really well-rounded. They're not just disgusting. There are things, there are glimmers of humanity that you see in them that make you feel drawn to them in a strange way. Like even if they are despicable doing bad things, making bad choices, I feel like their characterization is complex enough that you understand why they're making those choices and it's easier for you to care about them as people. I think this was maybe the least successful iteration of that. Like for me, my favorite thing I've read by her is my year of rest and relaxation. This, you can see hints of what she, what she works toward in her later work, but I don't think it's that well developed here. This is also a queer story. Um, it's not immediately apparent from the beginning, so I definitely don't want to spoil it, but I, I don't think sexuality should necessarily be used as a twist. And if you're looking for queer lit, I don't think that you should have to dig too hard to find it. So I'm going to say it that yes, this is a queer narrative as well. And that made it more interesting. But ultimately, I don't think Maglu was well drawn enough for me to like him and I, I admire the work. I can see the foundations of what M Mashvik can do in her writing and, and I think this is just the beginning of that. So I didn't think this was particularly that enjoyable, but again, I read it in an afternoon and it is my least favorite of the things that I've read by her so far. I also did a reread this month. I reread a couple things this, this year, but this was by far my favorite. It was All of Kittredge by Elizabeth Strout. Now admittedly, I probably wouldn't have given this five stars had I read it for the first time, but in reading it the second time, I was reminded of how I felt and where I was at when I first read it. And those feelings of nostalgia made me enjoy the book more. I don't know if that makes any sense or if you've ever experienced that before, but I read this for the first time when I was 17, so about 10 years ago, and I loved it very much. I just really connected with the stories and the characters and the writing. I felt like I had forgotten almost everything about it, but when I was reading it, I really remembered so much, so much vivid detail that it really worked for me. 
It is a series of interconnected short stories that all focus on this small town in Maine. Some of them are very directly related to the titular character Olive Kittredge, but some of them she's just a passing character. Either she's mentioned in passing or she literally like walks by during someone else's moment. Um, but she sort of is what connects all of the stories, is, is her being a presence a really well-known presence in this community. So we see her at very various points in her life, mostly like middle age and up. She is a very prickly woman. She is not very well liked by many people because she comes across as very terse and very um, unapproachable because she's very stern. She's very no-nonsense and she doesn't soften anything for anyone's benefit. So some people read her as being mean and unapproachable and unlikable. But some people dig deeper and they find out that she is actually very kind and compassionate. She just doesn't necessarily know how to show it or the way that she shows it isn't understood by other people. I think her characterization is just so well done. You get to know her really well by the end of the book. And I loved the reading experience of this. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I definitely want to read more Elizabeth Strout and I definitely want to read Olive Again, which is a sequel to this. Um, I do love the way that this ends, so I don't necessarily think a sequel was necessary, but I will happily read more and hopefully it will be a good enhancement to this original text. I read a YA novel this past month as well, which was Woven in Moonlight by Isabella Banez, which is a YA fantasy novel that is inspired by Bolivian culture. Our protagonist is a decoy quindessa, meaning that she is a, a stand-in for the actual monarch of her people. When they were children, they basically swapped roles so that uh, she would, everyone would believe that she was the, the monarch, but the true monarch is hidden. They made this switch because their kingdom was overthrown by a rival kingdom. Um, the rival kingdom had previously felt suppressed by their ruler, so they took over. The new leader has demanded that the marriage of the Condessa to try and reunite the two peoples. But obviously she's not the real Condessa, so, but she goes in the Condessa's place anyway, and then is kept a prisoner in the kingdom betrothed to this guy. Protagonist can use a loom to weave messages into what she she creates. Um, so she uses this as a form to communicate with home. And there are other little magical elements in this book that come into play later, but they're a little bit more of a twist or a surprise. So I don't want to spoil them. But there's a lot of tension with her being trapped in this kingdom. And I thought her characterization was great. I think this book is also addressing really important political themes about oppression and colonialism. And what it feels like when the, the colonizers become the colonized. I think the complexity of that dynamic is explored really well here for being a YA novel. I do think, of course, it oversimplifies some things, but I think it was really nice that it was addressing this idea of, of indigenous peoples being suppressed by colonizers and what happens when the tables are turned. There is a romance in here that really bothered me because I just thought it was unnecessary and also really unbelievable because I just don't think that she would immediately fall in love with one of her captors unless it's just Stockholm Syndrome and then I'm not really encouraging that kind of relationship. And there's also an issue where there's a masked figure, a mysterious masked figure, and it, the author tries really hard to make you think it's one person when it's very, very clearly another person. And so when it's revealed this twist, who it was all along, it's just the most like, duh moment that I've had in a book in a really long time. The Mr. X were very sloppy and poorly handled and like just not convincing at all. So that was a little bit silly. And yeah, the romance just, uh, I did not buy it and I was really annoyed by it. And I think that it, it made ends tie up too neatly at the end. The romance I think was a part of things being tied up too nicely at the end. And so I didn't like it for those reasons, but I liked the whimsy of it. I thought the story was generally good. So I would recommend it, but it does have some, I guess, you know, YA pitfalls of things being tend to be oversimplified and it follows the YA formula where she meets three guys kind of all at the same time and you know that she's gonna end up with one of them at the end. And I just wish that YA wasn't that formulaic because I don't need there to be a romance at all. And I don't want it to be so forced. Like, well, you're bachelors number one, two, and three, which one is she gonna end up with? Like, I just think like kind of like a romance novel. Is it a YA novel if there isn't eventually some dude she's gonna fall in love with that she meets right at the beginning? Like. I could do without it. I did think in general that this was good. I definitely don't want to criticize it too much. I thought it was very fun. I liked the magical elements and I thought the tension of her being the decoy Condessa was definitely really interesting in her relationship with the actual Condessa and them communicating back and forth. I also really liked that part. And then finally, I'm gonna end with the nonfiction that I read this month. 
I'll start with the five just because I've already reviewed this and I don't want to talk about it too much here. It is a historian's look at the five women who were murdered by Jack the Ripper and Hallie Rubenhold dove deep into the archives to put together accounts of their lives, where they were born, who their families were, who they married, their children, their livelihood, where they were living, how they were living. And it really becomes a an account of what it was like to be a poor woman in Victorian London and how awful that was through the lenses of these five women who are often forgotten. So I thought it was incredible. I absolutely loved it. It made me cry. And it's one of my favorite books I've read this year so far. And that leaves The Magical Language of Others by E.J. Coe, which is the last book I want to talk about in this video. This is a memoir that has an interesting framing device. When E.J. was a teenager, her parents moved to South Korea and left her and her brother in California. Her dad got a really good job. They didn't want to uproot their kids who were in high school and had, you know, their own lives. So they left them behind and moved to South Korea. And her mother would send her letters basically every week, written in Korean with a little bit of English. So Ko has translated some of her mother's letters. Those are put interstitially throughout the text um, that sort of frame mostly their relationship, I guess. It's not really, it doesn't really serve as like a linear progression. Letters aren't presented in linear order and they don't serve as like stepping stones for what the narrative talks about after, which is kind of what I had expected them to be. I expected them, the letter to pertain to what, the text that immediately followed, but it often did not. I think it was more to serve as a demonstration of what their relationship was like when they were distant and what her mother's letters were like. So as a framing device, I don't know if that was the most effective because I think that there was a little bit of disconnect between what was discussed in the narrative portions and, and the content of the letters. And I wish that there had been more of a connection, but perhaps there just wasn't one in any of the letters that she had. And so she was reaching, I think, a little bit, but I still thought the inclusion of the letters was interesting. I also found the, the introduction to be a little misleading as well as the title, because I really thought this would be more looking at, at least in part, what the, the, the struggle of translation and what it's like to translate another's words and meanings into a different language. There's a very minimal discussion of that, but that is definitely not one of the major themes of the book, which was I thought was a little disappointing because I thought that there was a really great opportunity there for that sort of discussion. I really liked the first part of this book because it deals very much with Ko's relationship to her mother, as well as the other matriarchs of the family. Her maternal grandmother, her paternal grandmother, and even their mothers going back and where they came from and how their relationships with their own mothers had influenced their relationships to their children and the way that they treated their children. And I thought that that was a really interesting narrative that, that came together in a way that really made sense. Even though they were different women that led extremely different lives, I thought the discussion of that and the framing around the author's relationship to her own mother were really great, particularly because she felt abandoned by her mother, understandably, and was dealing with this feeling of, of betrayal and grief and loss because her mother left. So you see her deal with that a little bit, but the second half of this book really threw me. It feels like we accelerate through the end where the author realized she wanted to talk about later parts of her life but hadn't ever laid the groundwork for how to get there. So we very quickly blow past her dance career in like a chapter and right past that to her interest in poetry, being a poetry teacher, and then the, you know, ultimately to like getting to this book. And it just went so fast and felt so disconnected from the discussions that happened in the beginning that I was really caught off guard and not ended up not liking the latter half nearly as much as I enjoyed the first half. It felt like there were almost two books. I know that she was disc discussing her life framed around all of these things, but the end was far too rushed. And this book could have been 50 pages longer, honestly, for me to have gotten a better sense of where she ended up and how, and how was this related to what happened earlier? Like there's a part where she's trying out to be a part of like a South Korean dance crew. That could have been really interesting, but we just kind of breeze past it. I don't even know how she got interested in dance or what dance meant to her. Did it mean anything? I don't know. Um, we just blow through it so quickly and then she's on to poetry and poetry is obviously a thing that she cares very much about and is very passionate about. The writing in this book is quite poetic, but I just didn't understand how we ended up there and it felt extremely rushed to me. So it didn't entirely work. I would in general recommend this. I think it's a good memoir. I think it's very different than a lot of memoirs I've read, which is nice reading something that breaks the mold a little bit and is doing something different, but I think it's doing too much for the confines that she gave herself. This book is far too short for what I think it's trying to do, or it could have been multiple books. We've reached the end. Those are all the things that I read in April. I would love to hear your thoughts on any of these books, if you have also read them, or recommendations for me, what should I pick up next? 
Uh, I am hoping to read a lot in May. I'm really looking forward to it and hope that you are all doing well. Staying safe, staying happy, healthy, all that jazz. And thank you all so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye.